Hey y'all, it's Jennifer. Welcome back to my channel. Today I am coming to you with a mythology wrap up. Uh, so I've gone on a bit of a bender. I have been reading so many Greek myth retellings. I am going to discuss one that is technically a Roman myth retelling because it is a retelling of the Aeneid, but it does kind of build on Greek tradition, the Trojan War, uh, so I decided to include it here. But I have read so many retellings this past month that I thought it would be pertinent to do a video wrapping up all of them. So we're gonna go from my least favorite to my favorite. There is no Madeline Miller here because I read her books as they came out and I absolutely adore her. But uh, let's just get started with my least favorite, which was actually a DNF. Uh, and that's A Thousand Ships by Natalie Haynes. This is a retelling of the Trojan War from the perspective of all of the women in it. And I really truly did not like this. I really despised the way in which it was written. I don't think it really had anything to do with her specific retelling of the myth so much as I didn't like the way in which it was written. It was very jarring. It was very choppy. Uh, things were done out of order. She kind of flashed back and forth between different timelines. And I understand why she did it because some of the women who were involved in the Trojan War were involved in it for a very short amount of time. And so she really wanted to include a chapter on them. But then there are some women women who, of course, participated in it throughout the length of the war, who she wanted to give multiple chapters to. So where do you include these shorter chapters and these kind of smaller characters, these smaller female characters? But it really did not work well for me at all as a reader. The interesting thing is, though, that another book on this list also went for kind of telling things out of order. It went for an interesting relationship with timeline. And it actually did not bother me at all there, the way that it did here. So I have to think it's probably just Natalie Haynes' writing style. I got 150 pages into this and I had to call it quits. I went to the audiobook. I got the audiobook out for my library. That didn't help me either. I just really did not like this. I personally think it would have been better had she honed in on one or two of these characters rather than including them all. And I know people will disagree with me. There's a reason that this has become so popular. I think it was nominated for the Booker, as a matter of fact, in the Women's Prize. And so it really is something that apparently is very personal to me. I personally just did not like this. Uh, I would recommend it if you want to try it, but it absolutely should not be your introduction to the Trojan War. A lot of people ask me whether or not they should start with the Iliad or whether or not they should start with kind of a more modern retelling. And I tend to say, yes, go for a modern retelling because the Iliad can be very jarring for the first time reader because the Iliad does not tell the whole story of the Trojan War. So I do think it's beneficial to read a retelling that kind of puts things in a very linear fashion and includes those details that the Iliad did not. A Thousand Ships wanted to include everything, but the way in which it is told makes it very confusing for the first time reader, and I really didn't like it. And I'm someone who loves a Trojan War retelling, but I personally really did not like the decision that she made to tell this in this way. And again, I know that's me personally because everyone and their brother has been loving this. Uh, so unfortunately, this was my least favorite. My next least favorite is one of my biggest disappointments of the year. And that's Ariadne by Jennifer Saint. This book can only be called a disappointment. I rated this two stars. This was just so slow. It was so boring. And you have to wonder how that happened because the story of Ariadne is actually really riveting. Uh, so Ariadne is most famous for uh, aiding Theseus in killing the Minotaur. So the Minotaur lives in a labyrinth. Theseus comes from Athens. He is the Prince of Athens, along with other tributes that are sent every year to be sacrificed to the Minotaur. And so Theseus has decided he wants to go in as one of these tributes, even though he is the prince, because he wants to end this. He really wants to kill the Minotaur and know that this is over. Well, Ariadne, who is actually the Minotaur's half-sister, falls in love with Theseus and gives him thread. She gives him a ball of thread so that he can find his way back out of the labyrinth. 
So that is a really riveting story that I think would have been incredibly interesting to see from the female perspective, because we definitely have always gotten it from Theseus's perspective. He's a bit of a despicable person, but I kind of like Theseus. But that does not take up the large majority of the book at all. It is over and done with so quickly that you wonder what the rest of the book could possibly be about. And then you spend the rest of the book meandering. And even the part about the Minotaur and the Labyrinth and Theseus and Ariadne meeting, somehow Jennifer Saint made that boring. It was just such a tedious read. And this has always been one of my favorite myths. So I was really excited to see a more modern take on it, a more feminist take on it. Uh, and I do feel as though it just was a letdown for me. And I don't think I'm alone in this. I've looked up reviews on this since finishing it because I was kind of wondering, am I looking for things in these retellings that they are not trying to do? I mean, why did I struggle with the Thousand Ships so much? Why have I struggled with this? Uh, but Ariadne is one that apparently a lot of other readers have really struggled with and have also called a disappointment this year. But on the other hand, a lot of people have really loved it. So it seems like this is one that you either... Uh, are really enthused with or you're really bored by. And unfortunately, I was really bored by this. I know Jennifer Saint's next book is going to be about Electra, and she is my favorite female character from Greek myth. And so I am going to give that a shot. I feel like I have to, but this really doesn't make me all that enthused about that. It really kind of makes me hesitant about picking that up. But I know this was one that was very highly anticipated for a lot of people this year, and I still say take a chance on it, maybe. I do think it could be a really interesting way to get into this myth, but I do feel like it just glossed over some of the more interesting aspects of Ariadne, if that makes sense. Moving on up, we have The Silence of the Girls by Pat Barker. This has been on my TBR for literal years, and I have always had such high expectations for it because this is about my second favorite female character from Greek myth, which is Briseis. Uh, so this is another Trojan War retelling from the perspective of Briseis, who was taken as a war prize. Uh, so she is Achilles's war prize. And this book goes into some brutal detail about what that entails. Not just Briseis, but all of the women uh, that were taken by the Greeks during the Trojan War. And so you have some women who were definitely really happy about their position and feel as though they've kind of been elevated in society because they were chosen by great warriors. And then you have other women who suddenly mean nothing anymore. And so there was definitely an instance where uh, they talked about an older woman and her serving girl were both taken. And the older woman is now valueless because she's not beautiful. She's not wanted by any of the warriors. And her serving girl is now with one of the most important warriors in the Greek side of the Trojan War. So this has just been a really fascinating read. It's one that I've thought about several times since. I only rated this three stars though because I found it so anachronistic in places and this is just a pet peeve of mine in general. I know a lot of people like more modern language being interjected into these retellings in particular but a lot of people also really like updated translations where people use more modern turns of phrase as well and I really don't like that. And that's a big pet peeve of mine. I like this stuff because it is ancient. And as soon as you make it more modern, as soon as you make it seem as if it could have been written yesterday, my interest in it wanes. I can't really explain why that is, but there were definite anachronisms in this. I mean, I'm thinking specifically there were multiple instances where the word boobs was used. I just could not believe it. I said that pulled me out every single time. It pulled me out of the book and I thought, who wrote this? Whose editor said this was okay? Why are we saying boob in a story about ancient Greece and Troy? And I am not saying that there was probably not an equivalent word for boob in ancient Greek or that people didn't use slang in ancient Greece and ancient Troy. What I am saying is that you are trying to tell a very refined story, a very dark story at that, and then you use language that most people would term, you know, very colloquial, very casual language. It doesn't fit with the tone of this book at all. Uh, so I wound up rating this three stars, not just for that. There were parts of it that I really struggled with. I didn't think Briseis was fleshed out enough at all. I didn't have a sense for her. There were also perspectives from Achilles 
which I loved. And the end of the book actually almost made me shed a tear because my favorite instance in the Iliad, and it's actually one of my favorite instances in literature as a whole, uh, is when Priam comes after Achilles has killed Hector, his son. Priam is the king of Troy, and he comes after Achilles has killed Hector, and he asks for Hector's body back. It is so beautiful. It is so, so beautiful. And Priam says to Achilles, I'm going to do what no man before me has ever done. Uh, you know, I'm going to kiss the feet of the man that killed my son. And Briseis overhears that in this book, and this was the most exquisite part of it. She thinks to herself, I will do what multiple women have done before me and serve the killers of my family. But that really puts things into perspective because we think of the Iliad. And when we think of the Iliad, when we think of the Odyssey, um, when we think of the Aeneid, we think of the men. Uh, we think of the male characters and we don't think about the victims here so much. And so Briseis is a really important character in the Iliad, actually, and she's a really important character in myth but she's important because she was stolen from her family. Her family was killed and she was given as a war prize to Achilles. She had no choice in that matter. And so this book is really reflecting on that. And to me, the book gets better the further that we get into it. The end was so, so strong. And it made me want to forgive a lot of the problems that I had with it earlier on. But there were just some weird choices here. I think akin to A Thousand Ships, there were some odd choices here. But in my opinion, where A Thousand Ships was done intentionally, that was the intention of the book was to be written that way. Uh, a lot of the issues that I had with this, the silence of the girls, I thought were things that an editor should have caught and an editor should have questioned. Uh, so it was just a really weird sensation. It was a very weird book, uh, but I rated this three stars. Next, I read Lavinia by Ursula K. Le Guin. And wow, what a book this was. So this is the retelling of the Aeneid, and it's from the perspective of Lavinia, who winds up marrying Aeneas towards the very end of the Aeneid. And in the Aeneid, Lavinia gets nothing. Lavinia is not even really a character. She's essentially spoken of in one line. So Ursula K. Le Guin decided to craft a story essentially around a character that is a blank slate, that is just a name. Uh, and this was my first Ursula K. Le Guin novel, but I don't think it will be my last because this was so beautifully written. This book was so beautiful. This is the one though that I would not really recommend to people because you need to have read the Aeneid. You need to have been very familiar with the Aeneid in my opinion to read this because it is also written in that kind of choppy, jarring manner, akin to A Thousand Ships where you jump back and forth in time. And it's not always clear when that happens. There are no real delineated chapter breaks. And one of the interesting things that this book does is Lavinia kind of has uh, a connection to the Oracle, a connection to the gods. And so she essentially can speak to the dead, but the dead of any time period. And so she, throughout the book, talks to Virgil. Now, Virgil is never spoken of by name, but it's at the very end of his life and he knows he's dying. And once he is kind of fully dead, once he's kind of accepted death, uh, Lavinia will no longer be able to talk to him. But she knows he is from much later on. And he knows who she is, and he kind of regrets the fact that he didn't give her more to do in the narrative of the Aeneid. So he is the vehicle that kind of informs you as the reader and Lavinia as a character how Aeneas came to be in this place uh, and what Aeneas will kind of go on to do. And so there is definitely a lot of the Aeneid in the book, and a lot of it's retold, so maybe you don't necessarily need to be familiar with it. But I thought several times, have I had had not read the Aeneid, I think I would have been totally lost throughout this book, and I think it would have been a hard read. But this is one that's really, really beautifully written. I mean, it's just stunningly written, and the conversations with Virgil are chef's kiss amazing. But Lavinia as a character, you feel like you don't know anything about. It's an interesting thing to say because it's written in first person. You are only getting her perspective on these things. 
but you feel as though you don't know anything about her as a character. You come away from the book feeling as though everything that happened in it was at a really far distance from you. And I think that's really, really unfortunate because I think that's the Aeneid's strong suit. I think the Aeneid's strong suit is in characters. And I think this is something that I've always said and this is something that I've always thought because I really love Virgil and I really love Dante. I think Virgil's gift is that he could make these immortal, larger than life characters. He made them seem human. And Dante made humans feel immortal. You know, Dante really elevated the ordinary man into the echelons of immortality to me. And so I think that they're so good to read together. They complement each other so well. And I think character is really why the Aeneid sticks out to me as a great work of literature. It's why I'm so fond of the Aeneid. So I just think this was a misstep here. And I hate that this is apparently the only retelling of the Aeneid that I can find, particularly from a female perspective. I really love the Aeneid. The Aeneid is my favorite. I like the Aeneid better than I like Homer. I know. Don't tell anybody I said that. This is one that I'm just confused on because the writing was five stars. The story, because I'm so familiar with it, felt like four stars. But at the same time, I felt so distant from the characters. I felt like it's a book that I really can't recommend to somebody unless you've read the Aeneid, unless you're really familiar with it. Uh, so that kind of made me want to give it three stars. So this is one that I'm really torn on, but I believe I gave this four stars. Now we are on to my favorite retelling that I've read recently, and this was actually the first I read. This started me down the spiral of Greek myth retellings, and that is Daughters of Sparta by Claire Haywood. And this is also a Trojan War retelling, but it's from the perspective of Helen of Troy and her sister Clytemnestra. So Helen of Troy marries Menelaus, Clytemnestra marries his brother Agamemnon. Agamemnon is a big war leader on the Greek side during the Trojan War. And so this is told in dual point of views from both sisters, and it is so good. It is so good. I did have a couple of issues with this, which is why I didn't give it five stars. One of my issues is definitely a more personal thing, but another of my issues was that there was a lot of dancing around about Leda, who is Helen and Clytemnestra's mother. But Leda and the Swan is one of the most famous Greek myths, and it's where Zeus took on the form of a swan and essentially assaulted Leda. And that's how she conceived Helen. And so it's essentially an open secret in this book that Helen is not her father's child. And it's also clear in how Leda relates to Helen that she really resents Helen, that she doesn't like Helen because she apparently, you know, kind of reminds her of that trauma. But it is never discussed. It is never explicitly said what happened to Leda. Uh, and so it does kind of feel as though you really are supposed to hate Leda as a character. But I think if you know that backstory, you feel sympathetic to her and you do wish that the novel addressed that a little bit more in my opinion anyway it was such a big plot point this kind of relationship between Helen and her mother and Helen not understanding what she had done to earn her mother's ire that I think a real true conversation could have been had about that so that's just kind of a small nitpicky thing but the thing that is more personal to me that I didn't like uh, is the relationship between Paris and Helen. And this is going to out me as a big romantic, okay, because I really love the relationship of Paris and Helen of Troy. And I have this really uh, romantic vision in my head that Helen wanted to leave her home. And she was miserable there. She was in a miserable marriage. And Paris of Troy shows up and he shows her what love can be. And even though they've caused the Trojan War, essentially, they have each other. And so I have never had a problem with Paris as a character because in my head, that's just how things went. But Paris is a bit of a wuss. I typically don't have a problem with that because I view him as the more romantic hero of the story rather than the warrior. But in this book in particular, Paris comes off so poorly. And the relationship between them is done in a very interesting way. It's not the straightforward romance. Helen really reflects on things. Helen's characterization was really interesting to me because it was not what I expected at all. And what happens in this book is probably a more realistic 
take on what might have happened than the story of romance. But to me, that story of romance is what makes the story live on in my head. So I kind of took a little bit of issue with that, not a large issue with it. And I think it's something that will agree with a lot of readers more than it did with me. But I was so excited to see something from Clytemnestra's point of view. Uh, so this was a really, really interesting one. And it actually made me kind of reflect back on my image of the myths, on my image of the Iliad in particular. And so I just really liked it because it made me think and it made me confront uh, my image of what the myths are like or what they should be and what interpretations of them should be. So this was just a really, really interesting book and I highly, highly recommend it. This is one of my favorite Greek myth retellings that I have ever read and certainly one of my favorites about the Trojan War. I will say though, the second half of this book feels very rushed compared to the first half. I think the book should have been made longer uh, because it kind of decided to rush through some of the more famous events of the Trojan War, in my opinion, just to get to the end of the book. So those are all of the ones that I have read. I have actually also been reading some Greek classics. So I'm currently in the middle of the histories by Herodotus. Uh, I recently read the Lysistrata, which I didn't really care for. And now I am currently reading the Iliad. And this is the translation by Caroline Alexander. I decided to indulge and try a new translation this time because I really would like to read all of the ancients if I can in translations by women, uh, because it's really interesting. Caroline Alexander's came out in, I think, 2017 or 2018, and it was the first time a woman uh, had published a translation of the Iliad in English. And there is, of course, Emily Wilson's translation of the Odyssey, which I would like to read. Uh, there is Sarah Dudon's, I think, Aeneid. Uh, and then there is a compilation of a whole bunch of the ancient playwrights that were translated by women. So I think that'll be a really interesting journey. I really prefer the Iliad to the Odyssey. And I know that that's an unpopular opinion. A lot of people really like the Odyssey, but I love the Iliad. I really truly do. I think the Iliad has a lot of heart. It has a lot of emotion. I'm somebody who's just a bit of a sucker for Achilles. Achilles is one of my favorites and I love Hector. I love Hector so much. I'm just personally really attached to the characters of the Iliad, I think, and I'm not really attached to Odysseus at all. In fact, I hate Odysseus. There's another of my unpopular opinions, but I am really, really excited about rereading this. I am also currently dipping in and out of the Greek myths that were done by Robert Graves. So far, I've had a few issues with this. He has some weird nitpicks about the myths, in my opinion. Uh, so I am interested to see how I feel about the rest of the collection. But this and the Iliad are my current Greek myth reads. I would love to know if you have read any of these down below, how you felt about them, and if you have any Greek myth retelling uh, recommendations for me, because I'm still on a kick. I still want to read more Greek myth retellings. And please let me know down below if you prefer the Iliad or the Odyssey. I feel like I'm the odd man out. But that's going to be all for me today. I hope you're all having a great week. Happy reading. Goodbye.